apologies in advance. I have a somewhat lengthy intro, but it's uh, it's important given uh, the topic we're uh, we're dealing with and, and, and introducing our, our guests tonight. Um, so please bear with me. Um, welcome, you know, on behalf of the Crossroads Cultural Center. My name is Angelo Matera. I'm a member of the Crossroads Advisory Board. Um, this is an election year, and we'll soon be bombarded by all sorts of political messages. Most of the time, these messages was, will assume certain cultural and philosophical presuppositions aimed at manipulating our emotions and our psychological weaknesses instead of appealing to our reason. Often, we'll be presented with a prepackaged list of issues. We'll be asked to choose between equally unsatisfactory answers, and we'll be asked to choose between, uh, and we'll, we'll often be obliged to accommodate ideological categories that are alien to us and to place our hope where it clearly doesn't belong. At the same time, an election is also a precious occasion because it's a time when our society is forced to reflect upon what we truly hope and desire. It's a time when it's possible to exercise critical thinking, challenge ideological prejudices, and look at reality with a fresh eye. To take full advantage of this occasion, we need to step back and reflect at a very basic level on what a genuine Christian contribution to the political debate at hand can be. As you know, this has been the theme of a series of important speeches by Pope Benedict XVI, including his lecture last year at Westminster Hall in London, and more recently, his intervention at the German Parliament. Crossroads thought it would be interesting to look at the, at the political debate in the U.S. through the lens of what the Pope said. For this purpose, we have invited two speakers, both well-versed in the U.S. political scene and the teaching of Benedict XVI. First, one senior Lorenzo Albacetti, who needs no introduction, but uh, provides some details for those who need a refresher. Holds a degree. He holds a degree in space science and applied physics. Well, hold it, I lost it. <laughs> <coughs> applied physics, as well as a master's degree in sacred theology from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. He holds a doctorate in sacred theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas in Rome. He is a co-founder and has been a professor at the John Paul II Institute in Washington, D.C. He has taught at St. Joseph's Seminary in Yonkers, New York, and served as president of the Catholic University of Puerto Rico. He is a columnist for the Italian weekly Tempi, has written for the New York Times and the New Yorker, and has been advisor on Hispanic affairs to the U.S. Catholic bishops. He is the chairman of the Crossroads Advisory Board. Michael Sean Winters. Our second speaker graduated from Catholic University of America with a BA in politics in 1984, studied theology and church history at Catholic University. For 17 years, he was a general manager at Kramer Books and afterwards Cafe, a Washington literary and cultural institution located on DuPont Circle. Winters is the author of Left at the Altar, <laughs> How the Democrats Lost the Catholics and How the Catholics Can Save the Democrats, published by Basic Books in 2008. He writes the blog Distinctly Catholic and serves as a political correspondent for the National Catholic Reporter. He is also the U.S. correspondent for The Tablet, the International Catholic Weekly published in London. His articles and essays on religion and politics have been published in The New Republic, The Washington Post, New York Times Magazine, Slate, America, and other publications. He's appeared on panels at Catholic University at Boston College and Willamette University, and has served as an expert commentator on the church for ABC News. He's also a regular guest on NPR's Tell Me More and the Colin McEnroe Show. Winter's most recent book, God's Right Hand, How Jerry Falwell Made God a Republican and Baptized the American Right, was published in January 2012. And now, I believe that's it. Give you one senior to say. One more. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> look, look, we've got to change uh, my introduction. I want to work into one and add a few more things. Okay. Also, to remove the reference to Tempe, I no longer write for Tempe. Put instead in subsidiary, okay? Remember that? Okay. Some years ago, I must remember when exactly, 
Cardinal James Hickey of Washington was asked <coughs> to preach the Lenten retreat for Pope John Paul II and the Roman Curia. Do you remember what year that was? 85, I think. 85. 86 months. Okay. And immediately he asked two people to help him writing drafts of the various talks he was supposed to give, <coughs> and he would correct them and add them and ruin them. The two people were myself and the current Archbishop of Baltimore, Bill Lurie, who at that time was working for me. In any case, we sat down to write our respective chapters. The Cardinal Hickey wanted to talk about the Blessed Virgin Mary, about Lent in the context of the experience of Mary. Archbishop Lurie is an expert on all the titles that have ever been given to the Blessed Virgin. You, when you uh, clean up his text, it's just one after the other. But one of his favorites, and one of my favorites, is what Ephraim of Syria said of Mary. He referred to her as the hearing womb, the hearing womb. Obviously, you can grasp immediately what's involved. Namely, Mary is not merely the biological conceiver of the word, but also through her faith. In fact, in many ways, many of the fathers of the church insisted that she first conceived by faith, and then as a result, in the womb. But Cardinal Hickey absolutely despised this title. He said, I'm not going to go into I don't talk like that, he kept saying. I'm not going to go there in front of the Pope and the Curia and talk about the church in America in terms of a hearing womb. Who ever heard of a hearing womb? So we made it a point to include the hearing womb in everything we wrote. <laughs> to drive him crazy. Why do I bring that up? Because if there's to be a title to this speech of the Pope to the uh, German Parliament, maybe it could have been called the listening heart. The listening heart, which is a term used throughout the speech to refer to the to that which should be the quality of a politician. When you bring together the listening heart and the hearing womb, what can happen? A listening heart. The Pope begins his speech by saying that as a German, speaking with the German parliament, a lot of what he's going to say reflects the experience, his own experience of his country. But that he is aware of the fact that he has been invited now to speak, not as a German, but as Pope, to address the whole world. This is his task. And in order to do that, however, he begins by choosing a biblical passage from the first book of Kings, verses 3 to 9, you will recall that Solomon had just been crowned king, and the Lord appeared to him and asked him what he wanted as a gift for the occasion. Anything he wanted, God would grant him. And he mentioned success especially wealth, but success in his activities, in his plans, in his projects, even for his own people. He tempted him or offered to him a long life, a destruction of all of his enemies, and 
Solomon rejected all of them. He said what he wanted was a listening heart. That is all he needed to fulfill his mission of being the king of, of the people of God, of Israel. A listening heart. In many ways, this entire speech is a development of the Pope's thinking as to what he means by a listening heart. The Pope underlines that the motivation of a politician cannot be success nor material gain, but the motivation should be a striving for justice. Politics itself, these are his very words, is striving for justice. Obviously, there is nothing wrong in wishing to succeed. <laughs> I mean, what kind of idiot would want to lose? The problem is not the desire to succeed in the political plans, military plans, or whatever, economic plans that you develop in order to in your in your quest for justice. The problem is not to want to succeed, but he said this desire for success should be subordinated to the criterion of justice. Subordinated to the criterion of justice. What to do, what is right, and how to understand what is wrong. Then he goes to St. Augustine in one of my favorite phrases. When he says, without justice, what else would a state be but a great band of robbers? Not leaving much space in between justice and a bit of good. No, either justice or a band of robbers. The detachment of power from the thirst for what is right, the detachment of power from the search of justice is the source of our many of our difficulties and dangers today. Indeed, to serve right and to fight against the dominion of evil remains the fundamental task of the politician. Today it is a particular urgency, he says, that we grasp this, that we understand this, that we follow this because of the problems we face. <coughs> this is of a special urgency today, he says, when man quote him now, man can manipulate himself, he can make human beings, and he can deny them their humanity. In that context, how do we recognize what is right? How can we discern between good and evil? I might say, to repeat again, the discerning capacity is what he calls the learning heart. We discern what is good and evil if we have a learning heart. How to discern what is truly what is truly right and what may appear right. Solomon's request remains, he says, the decisive issue, the decisive issue facing politicians and politics today. The dignity of politics is precise, lies precisely in the fact that it can be the expression of this capacity of the learning heart. When the politics 
is not that, when it is not following the orientation, if you wish, of the learning heart, then it loses its dignity because it has lost its contact with the intelligence and the heart of a human being. Today, we need this learning heart in order to deal with the many serious and urgent dangers to the human race. At this point, I would say that this speech is a continuation, if you wish, a summary and continuation of what he said in a dialogue with the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas. I have a reference here, the title of the book is The Dialectics of Secularization by Joseph Ratzinger and Jürgen Habermas. This encounter between the two, this dialogue was held on June 18, 2004. Well, it was very successful for Ratzinger because in very a short time, namely <laughs> on the 19th of 2005, he was elected Pope. Habermas was elected nothing, but in any case, <laughs> he must have made some money somewhere. He was like charged for this dialogue. Anyway, in there, the problem addressed is precisely how to find a common ethical basis given all the possibilities there are in the world today in order to prevent this, uh, the disasters that could befall the human race. And both of them, in many ways, offered how their own point of view should be developed in order to arrive at this, developed by means of dialogue between the two sides. The majority, one possibility, says Ratzinger, is that the law, ethic, the ethics that inspires the law be based on the majority or the opinion of a majority. However, he says, this may serve in, in a number of even important occasions, but it cannot do what, what is needed today. Here, he remembers his own country and the Hitler horror, which began with the majority vote but it spawned resistance movements against the Nazi regimes and other totalitarian re regimes where the law is actually unlawful. The problem is, fine, you can go and have a resistance movement, and I mean, you, ha you would have to be blind not to realize that you are in the right in this case and that the system is unjust that is being used to destroy lives but to what can you appeal to those who don't see it this way maybe the case of Hitler is just too self-evident but there are other cases to what can one appeal in order to to have a common ethical system. And then he arrives at this point. If the majority rule cannot do it, maybe religion can. Religion was the source of the view of what was right and wrong, ethical or unethical, for a long, long time. But then he says, something that has been a very important point in the thought of Ratzinger about the 
Jesus. You'll find it way back in the introduction to Christianity even. Unlike other great religions, this is a key phrase, Christianity has never, never proposed a revealed body of law to the state and to society. Never. So much so, for example, that proposing what he is proposing in this very speech, as an example, you find something that you might think is very uncharacteristic of Ratzinger, and that is to my, I read it twice, three times looking for it, I don't think the speech mentions ever Jesus Christ. Because the speech is an example what he said Christianity decided to do, which is not to appeal to revelation, not to appeal to the divinity, rather to nature and reason, to the harmony between objective and subjective reason. That harmony, we will discover, must be rooted in the experience of a creative region, reason, namely God. Christians, the first Christians, align themselves with philosophical and juridical movements that began in the first in the first half of the second century before Christ. The movement, the result of the encounter between Stoicism and Roman law. Christianity aligned itself with this group in its critique of religion as the source of a just society. This is the birth of the juridical culture that to this day can be found in the Declaration of Human Rights because the German owned Basic Law of 1949 the nation is committed to, quote, inviolable and inalienable human rights as the foundation of human community of peace and justice in the world. The Christian alignment with this way of approaching the problem of a common human ethics goes back, as can be found even in the scripture itself, the New Testament, especially as you know, in St. Paul, in the second chapter of the Epistle to the Romans, verses 14. <coughs> this approach is an approach to a human conscience that vibrates with the word addressed to us through nature and grasp through reason. Conscience, we use the word today. Conscience, he says, is nothing but a listening heart. It is reason open to the language of being. However, he acknowledges, today this has become very problematic. There has been a dramatic shift the natural law today, this approach of appeal to nature and reason, as seen as only distinctive Catholic and affecting Catholics. How did it get this way? How did the unbridgeable gap, the gulf he calls it, between is is being existed and ought ethical call. How could it have been imposed or how could it have happened leading to two completely different planes? In one is that of the is plane, the natural one ruled today by positivism, and in the other one the fundamentalism that appeals to religious experiences that are not universal. 
actually, I thought that he's uh, making this point. You know, you've stolen this. The secularization. I know it's for uh, uh, he was, uh, I know that you reward it because of the relic value. <laughs> in the book, in the discussion with Habermas, talking about why the natural law approach is so difficult or if not really impossible today outside the Catholic Church and in many ways also within the Catholic Church, he says the following. The natural law has remained especially in the Catholic Church, the key issue in dialogues with the secular society and with other communities of faith. Unfortunately, this instrument has become blunt. The idea of the natural law presupposes the concept of nature in which nature and reason overlap since nature itself is rational. However, this view of nature has capsized. Nowadays, we think that nature as such is not rational. Even if there is rational behavior within nature, once you deny rationality to nature, what is left? This is the same point that he makes, only that he identifies this denial of rationality to nature as positivism. This dominance in the culture of positivism is at the root of the separation between ethics and being. The situation is dramatic. In many ways, he says, it is my intention in this speech to urge you to launch a public debate on this matter a public debate on this matter. Positive, positivism has an important dimension of a solution perhaps, but this range is too narrow. It cannot account for all of human experience. It cannot account with what Father Giussani would call the desires of the heart. What is needed today is the religious sense, the thinking that goes all the way to an openness, to infinity, but that makes sure along the way that all attempts to reduce the range of human reasoning be resisted and denounced and shown to be unnecessary because they form, if we don't do that, like a prison, like a cage in which the human heart is locked. How can it break out of this? How can it break out of this? Its language, is not understood or accepted. The power is in the hands of positivist thinking. How does the learning heart break out of the prison? And here, interestingly, he gives an example. The example is the ecological movement in Germany. This movement, he says, which he dissociates himself from any particular of the Green parties, or even any particular position of the ecological movement people, 
he is underlining the methodology, the motivation for an ecological movement. This movement is like a cry for fresh air, the search to affirm the dignity of the earth, to listen to the language of nature. What is needed is an ecology of man who also has a nature. Man is intellect, will, and nature. <coughs> True freedom is when these three are in harmony. Is such a debate precisely on this point, using this as an example possible, will it open our hearts to the reality of the Creator Spiritus? Will it open our culture? And then he returns to Solomon. Solomon's request made of him is made to all politicians today. <coughs> we need a listening heart, the capacity to discern between good and hard. The religious sense, the listening heart, is, is an examination of the formation of this listening heart and its education. When Father Giussani wrote the book, he insisted that he did not begin with that in order to then move to the role of Christ. Actually, he began with for Christ. The experience of faith in Christ opens one's reason to the search for the learning heart. So, the two do, in a way, come together. The hearing womb allows us to reach the listening heart. Thank you.